Hey, y'all. My name is Daniel DeGrasse, and welcome to my presentation on the Flexboard. This is about the process of developing Zephyr on a keyboard that runs it. So first off, who am I? So I'm an embedded engineer at NXP. I maintain the disk and SD host controller code, as well as more recently the MIPI DBI subsystem. I'm focused kind of on displays and video applications. Beyond that, I've been doing some stuff with Quox recently. I have a presentation on that later this week if you want to come argue with me. Um, <laughs> beyond that, yeah, I'm just generally active in NXP upstream. And the reason I want to point this all out is, you know, this is, this is a keyboard. This is more of a product. So why did I build this? It's a fun challenge, frankly. Um, it's, it's just fun to fool with. And honestly, it's product design without the pressure, you know. I'm using this, and a good friend of mine from school worked on this with me. So it's two people we have to make it work with. And if it doesn't work, I have one person coming to me for help. And I can tell them that I'm busy. So beyond this, uh, we had some specific design requirements. So I wanted to build a keyboard that was, I'm, I'm going to call it normal. I wanted to build a keyboard that was 110 keys about. My friend James wanted to build a 145 key keyboard. For those counting home, normal keyboards don't have 145 keys. This is the keyboard layout and a screenshot of it. If you are asking what M1, M2, what those are for, he doesn't know, I don't know. No one really knows what he wants them for. But he wanted to build it. I thought it'd be fun. So I said, OK, let's do it. Beyond that, we wanted to do individual underkey backlighting because we're all nerds. Uh, lights make us happy. Fundamentally, if it blinks, I like it. So with these design requirements, we went ahead and got started with the process of, of putting the keyboard together. So the first thing to deal with was component selection process. So this was a long-term project because I have a full-time job, and this is something I do when I want to. We started it during the chip shortage, and that was fun, a cool process, but we ended up going with a K22. And a couple of reasons. One, uh, it's, it's NXP. Frankly, I work for NXP. Uh, if I'm too confused, I do know the system engineers. They might not help, but I can certainly try. And I know the part. You know, I'm familiar with the Kinetis series. It's a pretty standard MCU. It has USB support. We need that for a keyboard. 100 frame rate score clock. We picked one initially with a high pin count because in the initial rev of this, we wanted to drive the LEDs with the MCU itself. It turns out, for anyone trying to do this, that is a bad idea. Uh, your LEDs will draw more current the more you turn on. They'll get dim. And then you have a whole bunch of logic managing this on the MCU side that, frankly, bogs down your keyboard scanning rate. So we ended up getting a custom LED controller for this. And that's where the first software support comes in. We picked the Kinetis K22 because it was an entry part. It's supported. That's fine. There's no existing support for this controller entry. I, I honestly was like, fine. I'll write a driver. That's not going to be that big a deal. And it'll be fun, right? So we picked this controller out. There were similar drivers entry. So I wasn't too worried. I could use those as an example to get started. From there, this will go through kind of fast because I am no mechanical engineer. And I can only design a PCB when forced. So you know we're going to go through it quick, just to give you an idea of what this looks like. So this is the first PCB that I did for this. It's called FlexiEval. This is kind of a fun little evaluation kit, because I wanted to, one, make sure bring up was fine. And two, I wanted to make sure that the LED controller could do what we thought it would. So this is just a simple validation. And I shipped, I think it was five bucks on JLC PCB. So shout out to them remarkably cheap. And we brought up Zephyr on this thing initially. It was also great, I realized further on, because when you are developing features for your keyboard and they don't work, uh, it's kind of a catch-22 if your keyboard crashes. You can't really keep debugging. So this was kind of the development platform once I got started with the keyboard, right? Uh, and this part was kind of how we started doing the bring up. And this is the board itself. So Flexboard, I haven't touched on this name. It's kind of weird. Why? If you look at these dotted lines, the idea for this keyboard PCB is we only wanted to ship one PCB, so they're cut lines. Essentially, you can slice this PCB to one of two sizes. You can slice it down to a standard layout. I think 
no one's tried it, but it should theoretically work as 10 keyless without the numpad. And you can, you know, solder up your keys and, and use it from there. From there, we just put a flat flexible cable footprint on there if we want to do future expansion. This is a reference, a nice cheap Dell keyboard. The reason I put it here is to give you an idea of the size of this thing, because the full layout PCB is huge. <laughs> it's really funny. Um, so yeah, that's the PCB design. Beyond that, the case. Again, touching on this quickly. We did the case custom. Again, it's fun. Uh, there's two cases, and my friend explicitly requested that I mention the full-sized seal case because it is a marvel of engineering. It weighs, I, I actually think the fully assembled full-size thing is like 20 pounds. <laughs> it's full steel. It's incredibly heavy. It, I've told him, I think if you dropped the case, the PCB would break before the case did. It's very impressive. I uh, had smaller aspirations. I wanted to be able to carry it for one. So I did a smaller case with, with wood and aluminum siding. And uh, he complained at me and told me I was a bad mechanical engineer. And I accept that. I'm not a mechanical engineer. And that's OK. So we did the two cases. And now we made it through the mechanical stuff. And we can talk about the software, the fun stuff, right? So porting Zephyr. So I got this PCB. I told myself, the SDK is scary and bad. I'm putting Zephyr on this to start. We're porting Zephyr from the get-go, mostly because I thought it'd be fun. So to get started with porting, I did the bringer process, right? Uh, first off, I just set up an outer tree board definition and a manifest repository with Wes. For anyone that's not aware of this, the way that I did this process was this is you know, a one-off application. And something I want to highlight here, right? this is kind of the learning process for me, because I develop upstream. Fundamentally, my job is to make things work on Zephyr main and to backport stuff periodically. But for the most part, I work with the latest version of Zephyr. But for this, I'm doing something closer to an application. I have to start thinking a little bit like an application developer, not one with all the requirements of you know, a full-time application developer, but I have to start thinking about all the problems that you encounter. So the first thing was I didn't really want to pull down everybody's HAL, everybody's abstraction layers, everyone's modules. So manifest repository, what this allowed me to do was basically just say I'm pulling down NXP's hardware abstraction layer. I'm pulling down Zephyr. I'm pulling down MCU boot because I'm going to use that as my bootloader. And then that's what I need. That's what I need from Zephyr. So from there, with that out of tree board definition and that manifest repository, I'm pulling down exactly what I need. Pretty much nothing more. And I got a simple board definition and put in, you know, UART GPA opens, put a loop during early in it. For anyone doing bring up, the way I did this was just a loop and assembly. Another way to do this, if you have an ARM platform, there's a hook function called the ARM platform init, I think off the top of my head, that you can put a loop in. The reason I did this was I just wanted to make sure if I had some issue with my PCB that I didn't realize that would show up late in the init code, I wouldn't have bricked the board, right? I could potentially debug it later. Because I've had that happen to me before, and it sucked. <laughs> and you've read ahead. I had a build error at the SOC level. What's going on? <laughs> this is an entry SOC. So, Take two. This is not the same K22 as the one that's in tree. So we're doing a basic little SOC port. Brendan's got a confused face. <laughs> um, so the first, the first clue here, this has a slightly different set of clock control registers. It turns out we're doing a basic but existent SOC support. And this brought up some interesting questions for me. Because out of tree support SOCs are supported in Zephyr. You can have an out of tree SOC. But almost everything here is in tree. Uh, you know, it's generally a K22. I don't really want to copy all the support files and pull that out of tree, but those are my options. I copy the support files or I modify Zephyr. So that was the first question. Am I going to fork Zephyr? Ideally, I don't want to. I want to track upstream. But the second problem I ran into is that you need new register definitions for this part because it's, again, a slightly different version of the K22. And since there's no way to extend the HAL of an NXP's HAL, I went ahead and forked it. So at this point, I, I did a fork of, of Zephyr and of NXP. The reason I want to highlight that, right, it's, it's something to be aware of. In my opinion, forks mean that now contributions are harder to make upstream. That's technical debt you don't want to have get introduced. And because of that register, <laughs> I'm forking. So. From there, now that I've forked, I'm going to do bring up on a downstream fork and then send stuff upstream as I go, right? 
I patched this entry support. It was as simple as grabbing a definition from the SDK. And from there, we're, we're good to go. It's booting. There was one more snag that's worth noting. Uh, not that anyone will run into this because this part is by NXP officially no longer supported and you shouldn't buy it, please don't. But, uh, well, unless you've designed with it, I should say, right, Britain? <laughs> so, uh, USB did not work. It turns out this part has a MPU controller. That's not present on the standard K22. Once we got all this working, I had a, a brought up basic board. I had this flex eval board brought up. I was confident I could get Zephyr running on the full keyboard. So now let's look at driver development. There were two drivers for this. Didn't mention this earlier. I put a temperature sensor on there, mostly for fun, and also because once I was done with this board, I figured I'd want something to use it for. I don't know, maybe we use it as a temperature monitor, right? That was a relatively easy driver to do. Upstreaming here was pretty painless. Uh, Marine told me a few things I did not know about the sensor framework, so thank you to her. And from there, it merged. There was a little more difficulty with the LED controller. The reason here was that Part of the reason I bought this controller specifically was it supported this thing called auto breathe mode. So basically this controller, it's an individual LED controller. It drives a whole matrix of LEDs and has individual control on each LED. It can also automatically, via registers you program, kind of do an on off glowing animation, which for anyone who has uh, mechanical keyboards, we like that. We love glowing animations. Uh, and I wanted support for this, but Zephyr's LED API has nothing like this. There's no, there's a API call to blink an LED with a discrete on and off time, but there's nothing for, you know, a, a pattern. There is something like this in Linux. There's nothing like it in Zephyr to, to set up a pattern with intervals and on and off times and things like that. So that wasn't upstreamable and the rest of the drivers merged. What I ended up doing, I had a conversation with the maintainer and what we arrived at is either we could do this generically or I could just drop the feature. And I ended up dropping the feature. The thing I want to highlight here, another learning point for, for upstream stuff, someone might want that besides me, right? And if they want it, they're going to have to pull my forked driver. But, you know, this is just something that I kind of became aware of here. Like, I didn't, you know, I, I upstreamed the driver without this feature, but I downstream, use the driver with this feature in it. I use a forked version of the driver because I think something I wasn't really realizing before this. If you, as an upstream maintainer, say, you can't do this, someone shipping a product, they're probably just going to do a downstream. <laughs> they're not just going to say, oh, shucks, bummer. I can't enable this. And it's another point where you're kind of forcing someone to fork. Another thing I wanted to highlight here for the community in general, response time was, was really good. Uh, the community turned stuff around a lot faster than I did, frankly, because I was only doing this when I had the time to do it and when I wanted to do it again. And because of that, I was only really getting online to deal with, you know, each PR maybe once or twice a week or less once a week. Uh, and something I realized from that as well, I've tried to be better about it recently, is like if someone's not responding and they're a community member who's kind of just maybe a drive-by contributor, we call them, they're going to send one PR, that's fine. As long as if it takes them a couple of weeks to get merged, that's okay. It's their timeline, not mine. And at the end of the day, I appreciate them sending a stream, right? It's, it's great to do. So now let's talk about ZMK. So the keyboard firmware here, um, I want to point out David Brown did a whole Rust firmware, which was very impressive. I did not do that. I used ZMK. I used existing, existing firmware here. ZMK, Zephyr Mechanical Keyboard, essentially this is a, this is a firmware built on top of Zephyr that enables a mechanical keyboard. It's got this classic stuff you need, the ability to pull and scan a key matrix, a whole bunch of different features you'd need for dealing with keyboard, uh, you know, like special key functionalities, layers. So I've covered some of this already, just as I said, but it has this ability to do behaviors, which is worth noting. This is kind of an interesting case study on how someone's doing a, a Zephyr application. ZMK uses a device tree to define these behaviors and then configure them, which generally applications, application device tree configuration is something we shy away from, but that's how they're using it. They're using it to do the configuration behaviors to define each behavior with, with specifiers, and that's how you put together things like your key map is via key press behaviors. And what a behavior does is that it essentially handles, handles key events and things like that and then passes them on as it needs to. One thing that this brings about because you're using device tree for everything is if you want to reconfigure, you need to rebuild 
your, your entire image. There's no dynamic reconfiguration in ZMK, at least right now that I'm aware of. And that means that you either have to rebuild it, pull down West, get that set up, or they have, they have a GitHub action to do it as well, which kind of reflects the problem that's obviously here, right? Not every single person who can buy and assemble a PCB then wants to download everything and compile their firmware too. Some people just want a binary. So then the initial ZMK port, as I said, it requires device tree definitions for key matrix and key map. This all makes sense. This is hardware and device tree. This is the key map and the key scan driver node for just that simple four button PCB I showed. Very straightforward. And then these key bindings, that KP refers to keyboard, key press, and that behavior basically means this is, you know, the key that gets pressed when you press that key in the matrix. From there, I just had to provide the configuration variables to the device tree and kconfig to set this up. Those snippets, you can set a variable basically to find them called zmkconfig. One thing I wanted to point out here that I thought was cool with West, I did not know about this, you can pass in CMake arguments with West. That was super useful here because every build I was doing, I needed the CMake argument to find the specific directory. And you know, I could have dropped that into ZMK somewhere, but it makes more sense to do it as a, a variable because that's something ZMK expects you to set during your build as an out of tree, out of tree definition. Uh, this is just a little about how key, ZMK works I wanted to highlight here. So there is this kind of key scan worker that gets events from the key scan driver and that key scan driver that's pulling this GPIO matrix and there's a keyboard designed with kind of this row column matrix. You set a row high and then you read the column and if there's a short there, then your key's been pressed. So that event gets issued back to this key scan worker, which then can pass it on to these behavior devices, which turn it around and potentially produce something like a USB human interface device HID event that prints into an HIE report that goes to the host. And that's how ZMK deals with this. So it's got a whole event subsystem to deal with this, which was also pretty interesting to look at. They're not using ZBus, but I think that highlights that ZBus is something we probably need to keep focusing on because if applications are building their own version, we could probably provide something generic, and we are now, right? So now let's talk about animation support. So this was also why I put all those LEDs on this board because now we can do fun stuff like this. And ZMK currently only has support for something called RGB underglow, basically just a set of RGB LEDs giving a nice underglow effect. We want support for per-key animations. This is open source software. They already have a pull request. So that was great. I didn't have to write this myself. All credit to the author here. I think it's Ice4J is their name. They implemented this, all I did was port it over. So that was great and really useful to just be able to pull this in and integrate it. It is worth it, and this PR has been open a while. It's something kind of that seems like some of the ZMK runs in with trouble. They have a lot of contributors and not as many people who can review. But I was able to pull this in, forked ZMK, integrated it into ZMK. And then one thing to point out that is kind of a you know fun story of things Zephyr does well, this used the LED API to stream data out to those LEDs. So I was not using the LED driver this person was. I don't know what LED driver they were using, but mine worked fine too. Uh, that was not the code I had to change. I just had to point this forwards because the PR was a bit out of date, and that was it. So now we've got animation support, and we have these lovely animations we can do on the eval board. There's one more thing I wanted to add. So I mentioned earlier that ZMK doesn't have proper support for configuring a key map dynamically. So this is frankly a problem for me because a couple of things. First off, flashware to be frank. Uh, I don't really want to reflash my image every time that I want to change something on my key layout. That is expensive for the MCU flashware. I mean, I know it's not likely to add up over time, but there's no reason to wear things out. It's inefficient, right? Beyond that, my friend James, I love him. He's a radio engineer. He doesn't use Git. I don't want to ask him to pull this down and compile it every single time. That's a pain. I am happy to teach him device tree. I will teach him device tree, but he shouldn't have to learn device tree to use this firmware, right? He's, he's our customer in this little role-playing experiment, and I'd like him to have a little bit easier of a time. So to implement key map configuration, what I did 
And I will point out for anyone using CMK, you're welcome to pull this from my fork. It's not really upstreamable because it's kind of a hack. But essentially, ZMK is storing everything as devices. And what you can do here is you can use, you can set an index for each device. You can essentially assign an ID to every device and then use that as a lookup table. And you can pull that, the device based on that lookup table at boot time, load it into a key map in RAM. And then every time you get a key press, you look at that key map in RAM, you look at the device that's at that location, and you call the API on that device to handle your specific key press. From there, I needed to add the ability to actually configure this. So to implement support for this, essentially what I did was I used HID feature reports. This is uh, functionality for anyone who's not aware. USB has, USB HID, to be specific, has input reports, which is a report coming from an input device like a keyboard, where the host is saying, the host being like your computer, saying, hey, what's new? What key has been pressed? What mouse button has been pressed? Something like that, and the device is responsible for responding. Uh, set reports are going from the host to the device, and feature reports are bidirectional. That's what we need here, because we're trying to read data, i.e. our key map, from the device, and then set it back. From there, I just had to add in support. Le uh, the USB stack, and we're still in the legacy USB stack with this implementation, but it provides callbacks for feature reports. So I just implemented support for those callbacks, used the settings subsystem to store data that was coming from the host side tool, and then read that data back out to program my key map. And from there, I wanted to touch kind of on downstream fork maintenance. This is kind of a, a retrospective slide I wanted to highlight. Something that I didn't really realize until I started working on this project slash easy version of a product. I built this on 3.3 and pulled patches back and I haven't updated it. And I probably won't. It's a keyboard. It doesn't have Bluetooth. I mean, it could be hacked, but it doesn't need safety certification. If it got hacked, I would not be able to type. And, you know, I know there's bad USB and stuff, but at the end of the day, likely I'll just, I'll patch this with anything I need to, and I'll keep it on 3.3. And I wanted to point that out, right, because I do development upstream. 3.3 is old news to me, but for this specific firmware, that's, that's the version I'm using, and it's the version I'll use unless a feature comes out. For ZMK, I patched it more significantly. I think probably for anyone doing a product on this, they're likely pulling it down since it's MIT licensed, patching it, and then releasing a binary based on a patched version, just because the license allows them to do that, and it, it makes sense. Um, so this is the final product. Like I said, it runs um, ZMK 3.3. I'm using MC boot USB DFU mode to update the firmware, so it's relatively simple to do that. The only problem is you have to have another keyboard connected, because when you go put it in DFU mode, you lose your keyboard. Um, you can support key map configuration just via a simple USB endpoint and a little C-host program. There's key backlight controls, and these features are things that come with CMK, full key roll, full in-key rollover, so you can press any number of keys, they'll show up on your system on the other side, and then support for media controls. So then just a little bit of a retrospective I wanted to do with this. Uh, the first thing is I think I've seen Nordic actually doing a little bit of this, Carlos, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like Nordic's looking at ways to extend SSEs downstream. And this I think we should look at because, you know, it, it, was, it was frankly a little bit annoying. I had to fork Zephyr almost immediately during bring up. Um, it was surprising too. I was like kind of bummed. I was like, shoot, I really wanted to track upstream with this, but at the end of the day, this is a new SOC and it's not, it's not gonna make sense to pull all this code out and try and maintain it release to release. I should probably just patch entry and then try to upstream. And, you know, I guess I should note, the SOC is in fact upstream. Um, like I said, it's legacy, but it is there if you have this and you'd like to use it with Zephyr. Beyond that, I think we should probably look at ways health can, can extend themselves. I know, not to call out an XP, but we, we have, you know, it's hard to inject a new SOC into our how. You can't really just inject into the build flow where you need to, to put in an out of tree SOC definition, if that's something you need to do, which it might be, right? There's parts that we don't officially support in our, in our hardware abstraction layer that people probably do use. And I think Hal's probably should look at a way to deal with that 
because you know, there are probably customers that want that. And like I said earlier, ideally you want, don't want customers to have to fork your, your project. Uh, beyond that, ZMK was kind of an interesting example of a downstream application to look at. Uh, one thing I noticed, they have now updated to, to 3.5, Zephyr 3.5, but I was on 3.3 because ZMK was based on 3.3 when I started working on this. That's a little concerning. It takes them you know, that, that much time to update. It is you know, a, a project that has, I believe, one, one main maintainer who does a very good job, but that is one person. But I think it's something to consider. Like, are we, is our velocity so fast that this project is having a lot of trouble updating version to version? And if so, do, do we need to provide better guides? Beyond that, I highlighted this earlier, um, that it has its own event subsystem. Kind of just something I wanted to point out because it's evidence that we should be investing in something like Zbus. We should be investing in an event subsystem for Zephyr because that's something applications are needing. One thing I also wanted to point out, just kind of at the end here, the uh, old man screaming at the clouds about testing. Uh, <laughs> when I initially went to pull down the support for, for Zephyr, the Kinetis USB driver just did not work with USB DSU mode and hadn't worked for like a release. Um, it's kind of just a general question as far as testing that I think we, we need to look at is USB seems like it frequently slips under the radar as something we test upstream. We find out long after the bug was introduced that in fact USB isn't working or this specific USB feature isn't working on this platform. Um, yeah, and that concludes the presentation. If you have any questions or uh, would like to see that shoddy wooden and aluminum case, I have the keyboard up here. So. Thanks so much. Yeah. Testing, testing, okay. Uh, thanks, Daniel, that was great. Uh, you mentioned that the dynamic configuration feature is not upstreamable. Yeah. Uh, what do you think it would take to, to make it upstream? upstreamable? Yeah. Sure, yeah, that's, that's a good question. I think the main thing that I didn't love about it was the way I'm storing that configuration data in, into ROM. I, I, I don't wanna dive into all the details right here just because I don't know if everyone cares, but I'm happy to show you it after this. Essentially what I'm having to do is I'm having to kind of pick an ID for a device, which is somewhat arbitrary, and then use that like a lookup table. Ideally, we'd have a better way of doing it. The other thing that I think is kind of missing from it is a, a graphical interface. Uh, I don't do GUIs, they scare me, and uh, I don't even like to develop in them. So <laughs> I think that's honestly something that's missing is, you know, Somebody who can write a graphical user interface that's half decent because I certainly can't, uh, and it you know you need one to make this usable for end users um, because yeah, I we're, think we're not all. Pete mm -hmm. Johansson, which is the yes, no, of ZMK, uh, he's working on it's called ZMK Studio right now. Yeah, yeah, no, I've, I've been the, roughly following yeah. it. I, I mean, if there's interest, I'll absolutely submit it upstream. I have no problem submitting it upstream. I just didn't think it was particularly ready, but if there's interest. I will absolutely put it out. I have no problem with that. Right. Thank you. Yeah. By the way, checked on that PR in ZMK is not merged yet. The one you used to for the Has animations. It merged? <laughs> is it merged? Now? No, it's not. It's not. I said okay, that's right. disappointing. Yeah, because I'm, I'm subscribed to it. I'm still following. All right. All right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was just going to ask if you were to take a, a new path, would you do yeah. something significantly different? Oh, yeah. Just, yeah. Oh, yeah. Just curious. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, let's see. Uh, the MCU is way too high of a pin count. Uh, it's just that once I'd done the design, I didn't want to respend the PCB, sure. so I kept it as is. Uh, if I was going to do it again, I'd, I'd probably use our, our MCX parts. They're, they're good for this. Um, or maybe one of the, probably an MCX, honestly, because they, they have dual core, and that's something I'd love to fool with, because if you have dual core, you can do cool stuff like mm -hmm. scanning your keyboard in one core and then sending the USB reports on one other core, because those milliseconds, I mean, microseconds even, they really count when you're gaming. Um, cool. Yeah. Really, really interesting project. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So one thing I noticed, sure. you never mentioned JTAG or SWD. So 
Yeah, that's fair. I mean, it has, there's, there's a JTAG and has to leave header on there. I, I, I don't, not Go ahead. blaming you, but no, I no, look no, at these dev boards that people are making. Yeah. You know, hundreds, especially like the RP2040 and mm -hmm. one out of 10 maybe has a, a JTAG or SWD board yeah. on it. And personally, I find that really, really weird. Yeah. I mean, what's it like? Cause you mentioned also having to put that special thing in there so you wouldn't break your chip and stuff. Yes. And that wouldn't be an issue if you had a, a JTAG port on there. Was any reason? No, no, there was, there was a JTAG port. I, so I put a JTAG port on there. Okay. The reason I put that on there is because <laughs> In college, I was bringing up a TI SOC, and I put the RTOS on there, and the RTOS started using an oscillator that was not on my board, oh. and the board stopped working. Yeah, and I maybe I could recover it now. I was younger and stupider, and I don't know if I tried everything I could have, but I wasn't interested in finding out uh, if that would break the board, to be honest with you. Yeah, <laughs> so, one, I yeah. one, thing I would, one thing I learned from the JTAG is, uh -huh. you have a JTAG plugged into your keyboard, yeah. you're GDB'd into it, do not press control C on oh, that keyboard. Oh, I know. Yes. Because it sends control yes. C and then it repeats for Yes. Error. Because if you, I would, what I do when debugging the keyboard is I would take, I would comment out the USB HID report code so it didn't send anything back. And then I could debug all I liked. But yeah, if, if you're debugging your keyboard, that's also why I had the, uh, the flex eval board because I could, I could do that safely. But if you're debugging your keyboard, like you said, and you break in the debugger and you've sent your key press, uh, it's, it's not going to send the other report that says your key was released and you're just going to keep sending the key press and GDB doesn't like that. You can't get out of GDD. You have to unplug the keyboard. <laughs> I was just going to make a comment related to that and then maybe into the guts of a keyboard controller specifically, but uh -huh. with, with eval boards, I'm, I'm from NXP as well. I work with Daniel for those who, who don't know. We, we, have, we have a debug probe on them, but mm -hmm. even then you can get scenarios where the device will boot up, especially as security, and is immediately running the code, and it can be in such a yes. tight loop that yes. it's impossible for the, for yeah. the debug code to get control. So mm -hmm. I think some, there's a thing to be wary of if you have a super tight loop yeah. in there that you can cause problems for yourself, yeah. and you can brick a device that way effectively. Yeah. I mean, the hope is that you don't, right? But yeah. <clears throat> I learned once and I don't want to learn again, so. Yeah, we do have ways on more modern devices where we can yes. use this debug mailbox and erase the flash mm -hmm. to recover. But on older parts like K22, I don't think you can do that. I don't know that no. part. I don't know if a ROM on so. K22. No one's told me about one. It's a very, yeah, very <laughs> basic one. It wasn't going to come off. If, if it broke, it broke. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right, just... Quick, quick check on sure. since I was away. If there's any uh, any questions on the stream? No. Okay. So, any more questions? Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.